aggregate might bring some clarity into the chaos of your domain model. And let's face it, when you say aggregate or aggregate root, it sounds cool, isn't it? But what is an aggregate? When is it useful? And how do we design aggregates? These are all very serious questions because you don't want to enter any technical interview with anybody having this look on your face. Fear not, because we have you covered in this video, we'll put you on track to master what aggregates in domain-driven design are, so stay with me. Hey there and welcome to the Code Wrinkles channel. In this video, we'll start to master domain driven design aggregates by looking exactly into what they are, when they are useful and how to design them in our .NET Core applications. So let's move to our IDE and let's get started. This is the basic skeleton of a project management application. I have already implemented the idea of entity and value objects. And these are concepts that we have talked about in a, in a different video. So if you want to take a look at that one, you'll find the link in the description of this video video and in a card up right in the corner right now so you can get or you can go over to that and take a look now what we have here from our classes we have of course this customer which is a very very simple class we say it's, it's a value object because in the context of our project in the context of uh, well our business uh, needs right now a customer is just a company name we don't need anything else from that then we have this concept of employee which is an entity that has a bunch of properties and then we have the project which is another entity and here we have a bunch of different other properties so that looks like a regular domain model setup however if we take a deeper look at what we have here we have also a basic consumer application you can look at this consumer application even as the application layer that kind of like consumes the domain model the important thing is and what i want to emphasize that in this console application we are consuming the domain model so what we do here is we have this cedar class and in this either class, first we off we get a new list of employees because we need some employees. And then we get a project. And for the project, we get all the information that we need. We add some members from the employees that we create previously, and then we return the project. Now here in this console application, what we do is, okay, we get the employees and we get the project. So this is a very, very familiar setup. Now, let me walk you through some scenarios that might actually make this setup very, very complicated and very cumbersome to navigate as the application evolves. First of all, we already have a bug in our application because if we look here at the Cedar, we see that when we create a project, we actually add four members as a project team. However, when we create the project, we specify that we want to be the headcount of three. Now, the headcount might come from a work order and kind of like, of course, on the project, we want to make sure that we will not have more than three people on the same project because that's the headcount that was budgeted. So that's already a problem. Then there is a second problem, for instance, let's say that now the well request comes in that, hey, we need to complete this project. And then we would come here and say project dot is completed equals true. And that's it. However, if we take a look at our project once again, the business requirements here probably are a little bit more complex than that because we want to also set the completed date and we would also like to release the members like these employees should be available to be assigned to another project. So this is another bug that we might introduce in our application right now when we want to actually, well, set this project status to completed. And then there is another problem. We have in the project this list of employees, which are our project members. But let's assume that for the exact same employees that we have here, we have some other transaction in our application that happens and that changes something to those employees. Now, when you want to save your aggregate again in the database, you would probably get some concurrency errors, or at least you would get some results that are unexpected and unwanted. So we have here a very small domain model, yet we already have seen a big potential for bugs. How comes this is even possible? Now, the reason for that is that we have this project class, for instance, that is what I would call a free for all class. This means that really anybody in the application, in any layer, in handlers, in several handlers, in services, even in our API, wherever or whichever layer, they can change the state of our project and place it in an invalid state. And if you elude yourself that every team member knows exactly the business rules on how to handle actions on projects, I can assure you that in real projects, it's only a matter of time until somebody forgets about a certain point. So the main concept here is to use aggregates from domain-driven design. 
aggregates are basically a unit of consistency or a boundary of consistency. This means that what we want to do is actually take all these things that belong to a certain project and treat them as a single unit. And this would ensure that we would have consistency within this unit. Or with other words, it would actually mean that we can make sure that this object is never placed on, uh, on an invalid state since the reason or since the changes that are made to the state of the aggregate are done through the aggregate itself. And if you want to understand this better, think about a car, for instance, if you want to drive a car, the car is an aggregate and it kind of like exposes to you some behavior, some interfaces that you might actually use, for instance, if you want to blink left or to blink right, if you want to turn left, if you want to brake, if you want to accelerate, it's not that you can go at the engine or play around with the electrical circuits to actually blink or maybe to play around with the transmission so that you can turn left or right. No, you have an interface, you have the steering wheel, you have the blinker, you have uh, such interfaces with which you can interact and the car will always make sure that it will be in a, let's call it valid state. So it, it will do exactly what, what you require it to do if it is possible in that specific state of the car. And it's exactly the same in the aggregate. We have this entire aggregate and we expose some behavior, we expose some things that consumers outside can interact with, but in the end, the aggregate itself is responsible to make sure that whatever anybody else is trying to do with that aggregate, it would never place it in an invalid state. And in order to do this, of course, we need something like an entry point to that aggregate. And in domain driven design, that entry point is actually an entity that's kind of like the core entity of the aggregate and that has the name of an aggregate root. Now, let's see how we can actually refactor our code and design our project to be an aggregate and then see how we can make sure that we can kind of like make it impossible for consumers outside of the aggregate itself to change the state of the aggregate except through only through behavior that the aggregate itself exposes. The very first thing that we need to do is actually define what an aggregate root is. And we have this primitives folder, which corresponds to what we call in domain driven design, a shared kernel. And here we have defined our entity and what the value object is. And here is where we'll also define what an aggregate root actually is. To do this, we have actually two options and I want to show you both of them. Now, the first one that's probably the easiest to uh, implement is to create an interface that we'll call I aggregate root. And let's make sure that it is an interface. And this technique is called a marker interface. So we just create an interface that's called I aggregate root. It doesn't really have anything that we need to implement, but it's used only to mark, for instance, this entity that I want to be an aggregate root, that it is an aggregate root throughout or by actually also adding here this I aggregate root interface. Once again, this technique is called a marker interface and it's perfectly fine and legit. I don't really see anything wrong about that. However, as we have told earlier, aggregates or aggregate roots are always entities. We should never have aggregate roots that are value objects. So what I would like to do usually in my applications is I want to enforce this in a certain way and also make sure that I don't really have to write here both the inheritance of the entity and then also specify the marker interface. I kind of like want to have this a little bit leaner. So I will go here and I will rename this to aggregate root and I'll also go into this class and it shouldn't be an interface anymore. It should be an abstract class and then let's remove here the i and actually what we need to do here is we'll make it similar to what we have in our entity which is a the id and it inherits entity of the id just like that of course right now we need to implement the missing members which is the constructor and that's it it's just a constructor that we use to kind of like pass in the identifier to our entity class. Now we can go back to the project and right now, instead of having this I aggregate root and instead of also inheriting this entity, we will inherit the aggregate root of int and we should be gone. And this is how we actually have turned right now this project into an aggregate root. So we need to make sure that through this entry point, we perform or only through this entry point, we perform state changes. Now, in order to do this, what we need to achieve is full encapsulation of our aggregate. 
And to achieve that, of course, the first thing that we need to do is we need to set all the properties that we have here. We need to have private setters from them. So let's have here private. For the list, however, it's really not enough that we set it to private because as we instantiate the list, the list is already instantiated, so nobody will try to set it again. But what consumers will try to do is they will add simply members or add objects to the list or remove objects for the list and basically use all the list functionality that we have on the list. And in this case, we need to encapsulate this even further a little bit. So what we'll do here is we'll have a private field that would be of type list of employee and we'll call this members like that. And we can even instantiate that like this. And then what we will do here is for the members, we only need the getter. So we kind of can, we can replace this with an expression lambda and we should be good to go. And of course, we need to also change this to not be a list anymore, but to be an I enumerable. And in this case, what will happen is that basically that's just an enumerator. So nobody, no consumer will be able to manipulate the list in any way. They will be able to just iterate to the list. And of course, they can materialize it if they will call the to list method on that. And that would be basically it. So right now we have full encapsulation of the functionality. Of course, this means that we have some errors here in the seeding because we cannot add anything here. And we have also here because we cannot set this, uh, this is complete anymore. So you kind of see that we are already one step further. Now, the last thing that we need to take care about is exposed functionality that our consumers can use to interact with our aggregate. So let's go back to our project aggregate and uh, let's try to implement this functionality. Now, the first thing the functionality that we wanted to implement is, for instance, public, let's call it like this. It will just return void and add project member. Now, what we'll need here, of course, is an employee. Let's call it member. Cool. And the reason why we actually do this is because we can already safeguard or implement our business logic here and say that, for instance, if members.count is less than or equal to, here we have head count. So only in this case, what we'll do here is members.add a member. Of course, we could also have some validation for the member to make sure that the member is correct, but already we have implemented this functionality. And once again, this is only one place that kind of like well, manages the state changes for my entire aggregate. And that's the functionality that we expose to other consumers that, that will allow us to actually add members. So if we go back here to the seeders, what we can do here instead is that we don't really want to do this on the members directly. So what we'll do we instead is we'll call this add project member. It should be like that. And we can also replace it here, add project member, and then also we can replace it here and here, of course, and now we're all good. So right now we have don't have any errors and you can see in action how we can actually make sure in this case that we cannot add members to the list, for instance, if uh, we already have enough members. Now, of course, in this aggregate, you might even want to throw an exception that, well, we couldn't add this employee to the to the members of the team and maybe let the consumer know why that happened. But this is not something that we'll talk about in this video. We'll uh, talk about the main exceptions and how we how we should use them probably in a different and dedicated video about that. Now, the other functionality that we care about is that we have right now is we want to be able to complete a project. So what we can do here for this, we can expose the functionality for that. So we can go here and say public. Let's also have it void. Yeah, complete project. Now, completing the project would actually mean two things. First of all, we want to uh, set the completed date. It would be equal to date time now. Of course, that's really for brevity. Probably you wouldn't use the date time now directly. You would use probably something else, maybe a date time service or yeah, may maybe. I don't know, some, some, some other ways to kind of like handle uh, the date time. But then what we also need to do is set this is completed uh, to be true. And the other business needs that we had or the business role that we had is, of course, we need to release all these members because they should be able to be assigned to other projects, members.clear. And that would be it. So now if we go back to our 
program, instead of setting this is complete to true, what we will do here is on the project, we will simply call project.complete project. So this is the method that we have. And right now you see that we got rid of all the errors. Everything is working fine. However, there is really a very, very big difference to what we had earlier. Because right now, no consumer, nowhere would be able to manipulate the state of our project except through these methods that we have exposed and that make sure that our aggregate is always on a valid state. Here's once again a small primer on what actually aggregates are. So uh, aggregates are a cluster of domain objects that we treat as a unit. And how do we actually design them? Well, we need full encapsulation of the aggregate. We should expose behaviors to manipulate state and control the business rules, of course. And therefore, the aggregate becomes a boundary of consistency. And then the next question would be when we want to actually use aggregates. Well, we want to use aggregates when we have some more complex business rules. Don't use aggregates if the only thing that you need to implement are simple CRUD operations. This being said, thank you very much for watching. And if you have enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the thumbs up button. Also share the video uh, with others that might find it useful and leave a comment if you have any questions or if you want to get any discussion going. And I would be more than happy to get in touch with you. This being said, once again, thank you very much for watching. And until the next time, I wish you the very best.